Well, I want to I want to welcome um, all of you to our second week on uh, the Holy Spirit. Again, we're doing 16 weeks of um, just the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, and uh, I want to I want to start by introducing uh, just a, a real healthy principle for spiritual life, and you can kind of sum it up in one word, and the word is balance. Um, spiritual balance, biblical balance, and it, it, this principle shows up all over scripture. You know, you see it um, in phrases like speaking the truth in love, um, being wise as a snake and yet innocent as a dove, uh, giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And the point I'm really trying to make is that extremes can be dangerous for us spiritually speaking um it seems like whenever we drift one way or the other as christians a lot of times we, we get into trouble um and you know for for example when we get saved um you know we say that it is not by our works that we we were saved you know we did not save ourselves and yet when we come to christ and we begin to live the christian life out works come into play um, in fact, the word says that faith without works is dead. So again, it's, it's a point of balance. And I bring that up today because this is a real issue when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I know at least where I came from, but I haven't lived long enough. I know it's not just me. It, it seems that this is kind of the life we're presented. It's either one way or the other with the Holy Spirit. Um, either you're all in or you're all out as, as a believer. And so I, I talked about this a little bit the other day, how, you know, for some people, it's as if we embrace the Holy Spirit and we, we really lose sight of the Father and the Son. Um, or we embrace the Father and the Son and we kind of check the Holy Spirit at the door of our, of our spiritual lives. And that's not what we see in Scripture. Um, that's just not the picture we get of us in the Spirit of God at work in our lives. And um, so that's why we're aiming for biblical balance in the series. We're really going to let the Word of God speak to us about the Spirit of God. And I guarantee you this, that principle alone, it'll challenge every single one of us where we live. Um, so um, having said that, last week we talked a bit about the doctrine of the Trinity and um, I noted, and I saw a couple of shocked faces when I said that, but, but the, the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. Um, I don't think you will find it in any version of the Bible, and there are about 9 million versions now, but the concept is everywhere in Scripture. Uh, we saw even at the beginning of creation, um, there's the Trinity. We, we see all the way through the New Testament that this principle of God existing eternally as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, once you become aware of it, you can't miss that this is exactly who God is, okay? So having said that, uh, we're now moving into to three weeks where we're going to really look at the Holy Spirit at work throughout human history. Um, we, today we're going to talk about the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Next week we're going to talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and then the first Christians or the first church and the Holy Spirit the week after that. And um, w we have to settle an issue, though, before we get into this. Um, it's something really important to note for us as Christians. As we start to talk about the Holy Spirit and what God does and who he is, we have to settle the fact that God is supernatural. I don't see too many arguments yet. We're good here. God is supernatural. And that might seem ridiculous to say, but when you stop to think about it, just consider your everyday life. Think about the world we live in down here. Um, our lives are about, as human beings, what we can see, what we can smell, what we hear, what we touch. It is a very practical, physical, uh, visual world for you and I. Um, our world is cause and effect. You know, we, if this one thing happens, we know what's going to happen next. Um, we, we are creators of content as human beings, right? We, we do this, and uh, that happens. So, so again, it's very physical. But also as human beings, we have this, this tendency to believe what we can understand. If we can understand it, somebody can explain it to us or show it to us, we're good. 
And it, you know, if we, if we can't see it like that, you know, it, it, then, then we tend to discount it. So our world revolves around laws of nature, facts and figures, and the rules of society, okay? So we're all good so far, but here's the problem. The Bible tells us that God is bigger than that. The Bible tells us that God is other than that, right? I mean, we, we, we see this God in Scripture who time and time again, he is unlimited in what he can do. You know, a door will stop, a, a closed lock door will stop Steve Keller, right? And every one of you, it won't stop the Lord. God is just not bound by that. And here we are. I've got a watch on. We, we, we have these rules of time, right? Everything works according to a schedule. We can track the sun, all kind of stuff. Well, God exists outside of time. God created time for our benefit, right? I think to keep us on track. So we, we, we've got all that. And we also have a God who most of the time he moves within our boundaries, he moves in ways that we can understand, but we have to know as Christians that God is not bound by any of that. Isaiah 55, 9 is a, is a great verse. It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than ours, his thoughts higher than ours. And again, it's just a verse that says that, look, when it comes to God, we are dealing with one who is so far beyond us. So what we don't want to do as Christians, and I know it's really tempting, is we don't want to fall into an American, Western, modern-day mindset that what we read in Scripture is kind of over and done with. You know, really amazing that this happened. You know, God showed up in fire or, or you know, God, God did this or that, or we read about a miracle from Jesus. We don't want to see that and say, well, you know, that's, that's all kind of ancient history. Because the problem with that is it would suggest that God changes. And that's one thing that Scripture is really clear about. I'll read you just, just a couple of examples here. James 1.17 tells us, Our God does not change like shifting shadows. Hebrews 13.8 talks about Jesus, the, the eternal nature of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Good. I saw some of y'all finish that one. Um, Malachi 3, 6, very clearly God is speaking. And he says, look, I, the Lord, do not change. And so, so the point here is that we've got to be clear that the God of the Bible is the God we relate to. He is the God of today. Everything we read about him from, from his character, his love, his goodness, his power, they're all still true today. Having said that, Let's pray and then let's dive in. God, we love you. And Father, we worship you for who you are. We thank you that, that you are the one who pursued us. After you created us and we fell, you pursued us. You pursued us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I thank you that today you are winning people to yourselves. You are capturing young hearts like, like Elias's, God. You're, you're moving in our lives and we want you in your fullness. Um, we don't just want what we can see and hear. Father God, we, we, we want to be people of faith who experience you um, in all your goodness. So Lord, speak to us. Move in our hearts, our minds, our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, when, when I was growing up in the church, um, I didn't mean to think this, but here's a, a, a thought I had just in general about God. Um, I really saw God the Father as the God of the Old Testament. Um, I understood Jesus to be the, the you know, the, the God of the Gospels. And then kind of the, the, the Holy Spirit kind of took the baton from, from there on out. And that's not completely, like completely off track. But I was I was just really blown away years and years ago in my life to discover that the Holy Spirit is all over the Old Testament. I mean, he, he is everywhere you look. In fact, there are 200, over 200 direct references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Um, a few times we actually see that title, Holy Spirit, but a lot of times we read about the Spirit, capital S, or the Spirit of God. Um, we, we also run across some other really neat phrases like the hand of God which is the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach, or the breath of God. Um, even some of the passages in the Old Testament about living water 
are talking about the Spirit of God, and we see those times of refreshing and that, that can only come from God. But th this is who we run into again and again and again. And the overall purpose of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is simple. It is that situa situations came along um, that were pretty much impossible. In other words, they couldn't do it and we couldn't do it. There was no way we could overcome an obstacle or get through a situation or take a stand and God would come into that, that, that situation as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just showed up as God in action, and suddenly everything changed. So uh, another way to say it is what the Holy Spirit would do is he would bring heavenly resources into a very desperate human situation. And uh, we see all kind of things happen in the Old Testament. Sometimes we'll see directly the power of God on display, like there's no explanation for this other than God is moving. Um, sometimes we, there would be direct messages from God. God would speak into tremendous situations of sinfulness or everyone's got their hands up saying, what do we do next? And God would speak, often through a prophet. Um, we would see the light and the life of God break into uh, several situations, sometimes encouragement or just refreshing from God that people were terribly downcast and we would see God move. Um, you also get, of course, children of Israel, uh, the leading and the guiding of God. The Holy Spirit would show up and just send the, send the people on the right path. Sometimes even deliverance. People were in bondage. And God, the only one who could, would just set them free. Okay? So, so we, we have all of these things happen. But here is one key distinctive about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that he would come upon individuals episodically, okay? You got that? He would come upon, in other words, here's what I mean by that. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon a specific person in a specific place for a specific task and a specific time. And by the way, that time was always limited, all right? So we see that happen, and, and it's really interesting, the people that the Holy Spirit would come upon for these great God moments. Um, oftentimes, it was somebody who was very important, okay? Uh, a king, a prophet, a judge, some type of leader. Um, for example, David. Think of David, okay? David's a, a nobody, and suddenly he is chosen to be king, and the Spirit of God is involved. 1 Samuel 16, 10 through 13. Jesse's seven sons passed before the prophet Samuel. Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these to be king. Are these all your sons? Jesse said, well, there's still the youngest tending the sheep out in the field. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he had David brought in. David was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then God spoke and said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so Samuel appointed David or anointed David with oil in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, and here it is, the spirit of God came powerfully upon David. Um, this happened, as we pointed out in our Minor Prophet series, this happened to the Old Testament prophets all the time. These guys had not been to seminary. You know, they had not been watching the skies and trying to figure out what comes next. The Lord spoke to them. Um, the Spirit of God was upon them. Isaiah 59, 21. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, Isaiah. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, says the Lord. And so that's God saying, look, as long as you operate in the office of a prophet, you know, you've answered my call, you, you go out for me, my spirit will rest upon you. And if you wonder why Isaiah is such an amazing book, it's the spirit of God working through the prophet to deliver that, okay? Uh, another very important thing to realize, this is another big mistake I made as a kid. I used to read the Bible and I thought everybody in the Bible who was good, you know, all, all the good people, they were all superheroes. You know, so for me, I would see Moses with like a great, instead of a Superman S, I would see him with a great big M on his chest and a cape. You know, he's just a guy who's so much better than we are. You know, so much more spiritually gifted, so much more holy. 
even these important people were like you and I. They were normal. They were average until the Spirit of God came upon them for the task. And then they said or they did incredible things. All right, so we've established that, but it wasn't just important people. The only church in Colorado with flybys today. Um, but it, it wasn't just important people, though, okay? It wasn't just someone who was a king or a leader. The Spirit of God also came on very normal, ordinary people at different times. People that you and I, I promise you we would overlook them. We would never pick them to represent God. And a great example of that is Gideon. Um, in the book of Judges, I think it's six, chapter 6 through 8, we, we meet a man named Gideon. Now, when, when in Gideon's story, it is a terrible time in, in the life of Israel. Um, Midian, the Midianites have invaded Israel, and they have ransacked the country. Uh, I mean, they have defeated the army. They, they have got the people. They're just subjugated. Everybody's terrified of the Midianites. And suddenly we meet this guy named Gideon. And, and unfortunately, uh, Gideon is not trying to lead a charge. He's not trying to rally the troops. You know, he is not standing, uh, you know, just, just in, in complete faith in who God is. When we meet Gideon, Gideon is hiding, okay? He is in a wine press, okay, like a wine vat, hiding from the Midianites, and he's threshing wheat. So he's trying to get his crops all fixed up. I mean, and you can see the guy just like looking over the wine press, terrified. And suddenly in the midst of that, the angel of the Lord, some people translate the spirit of God, I wouldn't, but, but the Lord shows up to him and he says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. All right, that might be enough for most of us. We might go, okay, all right, that's all I had to hear. I'm ready to go. Gideon answers back, and imagine this with a whine, okay? Gideon whines back to the, to the angel, right, of the Lord. Well, if the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? God says to him, go in the strength you have, meaning go in the strength that I give you and save Israel. I am sending you. Okay? That would probably do it. That would probably do it for most of us, right? Gideon winds back again. How can I? My clan is the smallest in all of Israel, and I am the weakest in my clan. So it's kind of interesting. It's like David, you know? Gideon's the guy that everybody would overlook. He, he even sees himself as a great big nobody. God answers him again, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites. Gideon is still so afraid, he asks God not for one miraculous sign, not for two miraculous signs, but three miraculous signs. And finally, God does all that. He accepts the assignment. And then we read this in Judges 6.34, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and the rest is history. And, and the point here is simply this. When we look for a hero in, in, in this story with Gideon, and it gets more fantastic, he's not the hero. This dude is painfully normal, painfully ordinary. The hero is God. This is the work of God by his spirit years and years before Jesus shows up and Pentecost happens. Um, finally, though, okay, now here's the shocker and I hope I don't offend you with this, sometimes the Spirit of God came upon really sinful people in the Old Testament, and they were used by God. I'll give you three examples. One is Balaam. Uh, you can boo when you hear Balaam's name. Balaam is a train wreck. Uh, we, we have Saul, King Saul, who is a disaster, right? And then, of course, you probably know who I'm going to say, then there is Samson, all right? Um, Samson's story is in Judges 13, chapter 13 through 16, and Samson is chosen by God to defeat the Philistines. Now, every one of us, I think, when we picture Samson, what do you picture? Go, you picture a guy who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Or, or a guy after the Hulk turns green, right? Ripped with muscles. I mean, this is how we, we see Samson. You know, he can barely walk. He, his muscles are so big. Samson most likely in scripture looked like any one of us. 
He lo- probably looked like an ordinary man. There's actually nothing to suggest that this guy, you know, was just, he was just th- th- this ripped guy walking through pages. Um, even though he's known as a strong man, he probably looked like every one of us. But his secret was that the Spirit of God came upon him and he performed amazing feats of strength. But the tragic part of, of Samson's life is that he had a very corrupt character, okay? I just put it this way, all right? We got a lot of kids here today. You would not let your daughter date Samson. There is no way, okay? This, this guy was a real problem. But again, the point in Scripture here, okay, with the Holy Spirit, God using people, it was never about the person. It was always about the plan of God and the work of God by his Spirit through people in the Bible. And so God would use ordinary people. He would use normal people. Every now and then he would even use kind of, kind of a corrupt person um, to, to get a job done. And that's why another good rule, spiritual rule of faith, is never confuse a person's calling and a person's gifting with their character. It's just, it's just, just a fact of uh, sometimes what we see in the church. Now, two other points to make about the Holy Spirit, and these are important. The Holy Spirit all throughout the Old Testament points to Jesus. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but the prophets will use language that we will see later on in the Gospels. The the prophets will describe someone and will go, this has got to be the Messiah. So there was a whole lot of setup pointing to Jesus, getting the people ready for God's Messiah and the salvation that would come. Isaiah, for example, I mentioned him. Isaiah is filled is filled with information about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, A a second important thing about the the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that through through the prophets, the Holy Spirit also talked about something really big that would come after Jesus Christ, a huge event that would be a game changer for the people of God. Now read this to you in Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29. And it will come to pass afterwards... Meaning after the plane has passed? No. After the time of Christ in, in the last days, afterwards, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So not just a few people here and there. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. On my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, which, by the way, is the greatest miracle that the Holy Spirit ever does is salvation. You know, that, that's why, you know, when you look back, I don't know if you've ever looked back at Billy Graham footage, and you see him deliver that message, and all those people come forward. It's like a moment out of Pentecost where people come to Christ, and th- that, that's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and we'll find more out about all that in a couple weeks. Today, I want to end, though, with a final question, all right? Good practical question. So we're going to try and keep this real. So here's the question. Why did the Holy Spirit have to show up in the Old Testament? What was the point, right? The plan's in motion. God's salvation is going to happen eventually one day. Why does the Holy Spirit have to show up? And all we have to do to answer that question is look in the mirror. Just look in the mirror. I mean, what what have we always known about people? You can trace biblical history. You can can trace uh, uh, history history, you know, regular old history. Um, you, You can look around at our world today. You can look at the struggles that you and I have as people, and we know the answer. It's because we need God's help down here. You know, know, left to ourselves, you and I will not find the right path. Even if we found the right path of God's salvation and life in Christ, we don't stay on that path as people. We struggle mightily with sin. Temptation is something that it never goes away. And and so we, we fall into sin. You know, sometimes as the church, we have these periods in history where we fall asleep spiritually speaking we we also get way too caught up in life down here you know i mean sometimes i have to remind myself steve there's an afterlife steve you're acting like what is happening today is everything and it's a moment in time but but we get too caught up sometimes as christians we even get way too trapped in religious rule keeping 
And the point is we can't do spiritual life by ourselves. We can't please God and continue to please God by ourselves. We can't fix our situation. And so we need God to move by his spirit and get our attention and wake us up. And e even in those sweet moments we, when, you know, we have devotions in the morning, have you ever had that experience where you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm barely awake here. You crack open the work, word of God. You begin to pray, and you are just refreshed in the presence of God. We need that. I needed that this morning, by the way. I'll just confess. I was doing a lot of that back there. Lord, fill me up for this today. We need God, the Holy Spirit, to bring the kingdom of God to us, to draw us into life with God and, and this incredible love to, to make God real for us like he did for people back then. So that's kind of the point of it all. That is a wrap, all right? The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Let me pray for us. Father God, we, we anticipate together next week, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But Father, I thank you that you have always been at work. I thank you that, that your love there is not just words that we read about on a page, but you are the God truly who is with us. You say that again and again in Scripture. You have been our Emmanuel since, since creation, God with us. And so, Lord, I thank you for just how we, we can trace your activity and see you move on the behalf of people that, frankly, don't even deserve it, but you have set your love. You have set your love on us. And so, God, we rejoice. We rejoice in, in who you have been, who you are, who you will always be for your people. Holy Spirit, we, we thank you that you are God. You are our God, and we just welcome you. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Amen.